Amen. Let's read Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse number 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage and unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a coat with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a coat the fowl of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them on the clothes, and they set him thereon. And the great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And a great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. So for just a few moments, I'd like to speak from this topic, this theme, or this subject, the coming of the king. Amen. The coming of the king. Hallelujah. Again, you know, I love it when you help me share the word of the Lord. So if you don't mind, turn to your neighbor, to your left or to your right and say, neighbor, neighbor. the pastor is going to share today the coming of the king. Look to somebody on the other side, have a little conversation with yourself, if you don't mind, if that's the case, and say, neighbor, neighbor. the pastor's going to share today the coming of the king. Now, how many of y'all talk to yourself just now? Inquiry minds want to know. The coming of the king. Brothers and sisters, there is normally a lot of excitement and even anticipation in the air when a dignitary or when somebody of great importance is getting ready to arrive at a particular location. Because before they get there, many preparations are made to ensure the visit will be a successful one. A lot of people go out of their way to make sure everything is just right. Everything is just perfect for when this person arrives. Some people even make personal sacrifices by giving up their homes, vehicles, and the like to accommodate that person for when they finally get there. It would appear to me that some of the same arrangements were made as it pertained to the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. According to the text, people heard that he was coming to town and made arrangements to be there. Matter of fact, let me put a bookmark right here, if you don't mind. I remember, I recall growing up in the church, and I've been around church for most of my life, and I remember when there was revival time, And there was somebody who was called in to do a quote-unquote citywide revival. And at that time, when people heard who was coming in, 
They start looking at their calendar. Am I off that day? Can I make it that night? Uh, let me go to the grocery store early because I want to make sure everything is cool so when revival starts, I can be there. Special arrangements, personal arrangements. I recall young preachers would go to the pastor and say, Pastor, is there something I can do for this person coming in? Can, can I pick him up from the airport? Can, can I get him to their hotels? Can, can, can I take him out to dinner just to let them know we appreciate them coming in to be a blessing to us? Lord have mercy. I would love to see the church do the same thing today. When, when they know somebody is coming in to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should look at our calendars and make special arrangements because we know when I get to the house of the Lord, there's a blessing waiting for me. I'm hearing from heaven. I know what God is able to do. I know what he's already done for me. I know he's got a blessing waiting for me. I need to make special arrangements to get there to get my blessing. The text says people heard that he, meaning Jesus, was coming into town and they made special arrangements. Some even made it a point to do something special as he arrived into town. And these were the ones who cut down the branches and laid them in front of the Lord as he was making his way into town. Now concerning these palm branches, the preachers outlined in Sermon Bible states, and I quote, they said, these were a symbol of victory and triumph. Did y'all catch that? Victory and triumph triumph, which would tell me that they didn't cut palm branches down for anybody and everybody who came into town. Victory and triumph. They were waved triumphantly as a conqueror rode victoriously through the city streets. The point is this, the people were welcoming Jesus as the great conqueror and mighty deliverer. But Jesus had come in peace, not as a judge or conqueror of the Romans, nor anyone else. Not right then and not right now. See, presently, presently, he says, he is the savior of all men. Later, when he returns, he will come as king. Unquote. You see, the people did some things because they anticipated someone of importance to enter into the city. And we too should take note of when Jesus shows up. Amen. We do know when Jesus shows up, right? He doesn't necessarily need to quote unquote show up because he's always here. Some people say he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Y'all want to know why he's always right on time? Because he's always there. Amen, somebody. When he arrives, and even in this case, making his way into Jerusalem, he never let his environment consume him. Yet he consumed his environment as people wanted to be around him and actually wanted to take advantage of what he had to offer. I don't know about you, but that sounds like Sunday morning. We should want to be in the house of the Lord. We should want to be around the people of God so that we can indeed take advantage, not of what he has to offer per se, but to take advantage of the promises that he's made to us. And, and those promises are, I am come that you might have life and of that more abundantly. I'm thankful that the Lord doesn't want me walking around looking all busted and disgusted. He don't want me hemming and hawing all the time and barely shuffling my feet because life is so bad. 
I recognize that he's Jesus. And because he's Jesus, I want to live and I plan to live and I continue to live in the abundant life that he's made for me. Y'all might be asking me, what are you talking about, Pastor? When I wake up in the morning, I'm experiencing abundant life. The deacon said, when my eyes open up this morning and my hands begin to move, I'm experiencing abundant life. I'm able to get up and clothe myself and I'm in my right mind. Some people may question that, but I know I'm in my right mind. I got here safe this morning so I can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I don't know what you come to do. I came to praise the Lord. He's been good to me, better to me than I can ever be to myself. Some glad morning when this life is over, I will fly away. I think it's time for us to stop sitting down on God's worship. His offer then was eternal life. His offer now today is still eternal life. And just like those people anticipated the arrival of Jesus, we too should anticipate his soon return. Our selected text chronicles for us the last week of life for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But let me put a caveat by saying that this was his last week of earthly life. Y'all catch that? earthly life before his crucifixion and of course his resurrection. You see, he's always been. The Bible teaches that he is eternal. He's always existed. You see, that's why he was able to make statements like before Abraham was, I am. And they look at him like, man, you ain't number 30-something years old. How can you say you knew Abraham? But you see, the problem was they didn't know who they were talking to. Always existed. And we believe that the scriptures teach us that Jesus is not dead, but alive and will come back again one day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The text here helps us to understand what happened when Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. But stop right outside the city to a place called Bethphage. You see, he had a particular reason for going to Jerusalem as this was the place where victory would be achieved over the enemy and the power of sin in our lives. Salvation started in Jerusalem and it was appropriate that Jesus would go there to complete this process. But one thing of note here is not only the fact that Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem, but also how he's making his way into the city. And up to this point, Jesus had to to depend on friends for lodging. Back in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20, Jesus said, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And now he's making his way to Jerusalem and still needs to rely on the help of others to accomplish his mission. But I believe one of the things we can take away from this, brothers and sisters, is that the Lord wants us to be involved in kingdom work. You see, he can do it without us. He can get somebody else to do the work. 
But because we have called upon him as Lord and Savior, he wants us to be in a part of kingdom building. So that's why we can't have what I like to call sideline saints. We, we got we to gotta have people who want to get involved in the work of ministry. One, one thing I've learned about getting involved is that when people get involved, guess what? They really enjoy being with their church family. They look forward to coming on Sunday morning. And because they're involved, guess what? They become all-weather Christians. I'm going no matter what the weather looks like. Because I know God has a blessing for me when I get there. So he wants us to get involved in the work of ministry. Some people, if you will, will only get it when they see someone else have it or experience it. What am I trying to say? Some people, are, they'll only get it when they see other people getting involved. It's almost like you're having a bad day, yet you're still smiling. And people around you know that you're having a bad day. Boss came in and hollered and screamered at you all day long. That's hollering and screaming to the second power, y'all. Everything you did that day was wrong. Boss didn't like nothing about what you did. You got there a minute early, but the boss said you were late. You turned in whatever you needed to turn in, and they pushed it back because that's not what they were looking for. Yet you still smiling. People around you are like, you're having such a bad day. How is it that you can still smile? It's because I know who's with me. I know who's keeping me. I know who my real provider is. And when you think about it, when the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know I can do what the Lord needs me to do because even in my life, I may be able to convert my boss to somebody who knows Jesus Christ. I didn't plan to say this, but how are you going to reach people for Jesus? And I need y'all to walk with me. I'm, not, I'm, I'm hoping not to stay here too long. How can you reach people for Jesus when they see you all the time using special words? I mean, I could call them cuss words. I mean... Yeah, cussing. If, if you got a little bit of, you know, something about you, you're cursing. <laughs> Special words. And then you go to them and say, I know a man from Galilee who's got all power in his hands. He rose from the dead. He sits high and he looks low. And they look at you like, but didn't you just cuss me out 30 minutes ago? It's hard to reach people when you're not living it in front of people. So that's what I'm talking about when some will see it once they experience it. you living for the Lord. You're going through, and no matter what you're going through, you're still living for the Lord. So as I think about the coming of the king, I'd like to take a few minutes to see what it was the Lord was doing here to better understand his coming into Jerusalem. Three points I want to deal with today. The first point, number one, the Lord fulfilled prophecy concerning the Messiah. 
the Lord fulfilled prophecy concerning the Messiah. As the Lord was traveling to Jerusalem, he stopped at a place, again called Bethphage, which literally means house of figs. Bethphage was about a mile from Bethany towards Jerusalem. Once he arrived there, he sent two of his disciples to go into Jerusalem to bring back his mode of transportation to make his way into the city, specifically a donkey and her young colt. You see, today we have Uber. We have Lyft. We have friends and relatives. I'm a pick on him and Pookie Nims. To get us where we need to go from time to time. If you will, this was the Lord's way of using a biblical Uber. Y'all still with me? But this is something special about this biblical Uber. Because when you call an Uber today, there's probably been hundreds of people that have been in that vehicle already. But what the Lord was calling on was a donkey and a colt that had never been ridden by man before. We need to understand this, brothers and sisters. We must understand that nothing the Lord did was by coincidence, but it was all by divine direction. Because you see, in order for him to be proclaimed as the Savior and Messiah, he needed to fulfill what the scriptures recorded about the Savior. So let's understand that up to this point, Jesus had not made his way into Jerusalem at all, and now he's going there to fulfill the law and the prophets. Notice, if you will, the Lord's power. In sending the disciples for the coat, the Lord demonstrated his divine omniscience and omnipresence, if you will, to further validate his claim to messiahship. He knew exactly where the animal was to be. He knew who had the animals. Now, some people will say, you know what, well, let's, let's rationalize this thing. Of course, on his way into bad faith, he could have sent somebody to go check it out, to see where the animals are to see who's got the animals, and then they come back. Kind of like, if you will, send them on a recon mission. Y'all looking at me like, what is a recon mission? All right, for our non-military members. A recon mission is when you go and you scope out what's happening before everybody shows up so you can take over the land. Recon mission is nothing new. If you go and look in the Bible, you'll see that they sent 12 spies out to check on the land. Amen, somebody. Ten of them came back. We can't do this. We're small. We look like crickets and grasshoppers pertaining to them. But the other two came back. Let's go in and possess the land. Because you see, the promise was from God that was going to be your land. What are you going to do to possess it? They went on a recon mission, y'all. Numbers, when you get a chance, go back and look at the book of Numbers. You'll see it. Mm -hmm. So now we see that Jesus sent two disciples in to retrieve the animals. I would venture to say, brothers and sisters, Jesus doesn't need to send anybody on any recon mission. Because if I understand he's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing, and I understand him to be I'm not present, which means he's present everywhere all at the same time, no matter where he was, he knew where those animals were. Amen, somebody. You know, we say he's king of kings and lord of lords. We say he's alpha and omega, but do we really think and believe that he is who he is? Hello, somebody. Jesus told his disciples that when they found the animals, to tell the owners, the Lord hath need of them. 
Today's vernacular, the Lord needs them. Again, he needed them because he couldn't just get any Uber. He had to get something or an animal that had never been written before. But when it says the Lord had need of him, the word Lord here is translated Jehovah. Look at somebody and say Jehovah. And anyone hearing this would immediately know that there was divine implications going on. Because people just don't call themselves Jehovah. Amen. All right. With the exception of our Hispanic brothers and sisters. How many Americans do you know that have a government name of Jesus? I'll wait. The name Jesus is so special. It's so holy. It's, it's so righteous that people won't normally name their children Jesus. Because you see, they don't know how that child, if you will, I didn't plan to say all of this, but they don't know how that child is going to turn out. But let me help you understand something. Let me help you understand something. I read something the other day that said there's a man somewhere in Africa. I don't remember exactly where. A man in Africa calls himself Jesus. Picture I saw was him walking between a, a group of people, kind of like the center aisle here. And people were on both sides bowed down as he was walking through. Because he said, I'm Jesus. But then there was an uprising whereby some people wanted to lay hands on him in an unbiblical way. Actually, I think the story said they actually wanted to take his life. But he says, I'm Jesus. But as soon as he heard about the uprising, the first thing he did was went down to the police station. Because he was afraid somebody was going to kill him. The Jesus I know the Jesus I know, he said, you can't take my life. I lay it down. Then he said, and when I do, I'll raise it up again. I guess they were waiting to see if he was going to resurrect himself. I don't know. Jehovah. When they heard Jehovah, there were divine Implication, Lord knows I'm trying to get through this, y'all. One of the things we might miss if we just casually read over this is that Jesus here is claiming to be the Messiah. And he will assume that title physically because he is the only one who really can ride on that coat. See, Christ had a reason for making such detailed preparations to enter into Jerusalem. He was deliberately fulfilling prophecy. A prophecy noted in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9. And there it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the fowl of an ass. And here in this text, there are at least three things that we can take away from the text. Number one, the text says, behold thy king. It's letting them know that their God-ordained king was coming to them soon. The text says, thy king cometh lowly. Letting them know that he was coming in meekness, not as a reigning monarch. He was coming to win the hearts and the lives of men, both physically, spiritually. Sp 
spiritually and eternally. He was not just looking to give them physical fulfillment. He came there to bless them with what they needed. The text also says the king cometh sitting upon an ass. This was to let them know that the king was coming not as a conqueror riding on a white stallion, but as a king of peace riding on a donkey. You know, you can get there a lot faster on a stallion. That donkey might sit down and not get up on you. I'm just keeping it real, y'all. I'm just keeping it real. He was coming, if you will, to save the world through peace and to reconcile the world to the love of God. And in this, God was fulfilling his word to the world by ensuring the triumphal entry of the Lord into Jerusalem. As I hurry to a close, next we see number two, the Lord receives their worship. The Lord receives their worship. This part of the text shows us how the Lord received worship both from his disciples and from the multitude. The disciples didn't have any money and no clue as to where the cults were, yet obeyed the commands of the Lord to the letter. And once they got the coat, they took the clothes off their backs and put them on the coat for the Lord. I need us to understand something here. There is a difference between giving the Lord some clothes that you buy or taking the clothes off your back to provide for the Lord. It's easy for us to go to the 99 cent store and get some things when people say, we need this, we need that, we need the other. That's easy. It's something else when you don't have the means to go to 99 cents. Oh, is it a dollar 25 plus now? <laughs> they need to change the name, don't they? If you don't have the, the financial means and you got to go and get something that you have to give on behalf of. These disciples did just that. They didn't have no money, but they had the clothes on their backs. And they put it on the coat so that the Lord would be able to ride on the coat. The Bible tells us that there are benefits in being obedient to the Lord. We find in John chapter 14 and verse number 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You see, we got to have the commandments, but not just have them. We've got to obey them. You know, my brothers and sisters, it's one thing to have the Ten Commandments as a plaque hanging up on the wall in your house. But when you're breaking nine out of ten, <laughs> they said last night, a change going to come. <laughs> if you were here, you understand what I'm talking about. Change going to come. So not only did the disciples worship him, but also the multitude. Because the Passover feast was upon them, people from near and far began to gather in Jerusalem for the celebration. I read in one commentary that there was probably somewhere between two and three million people in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. That's a large amount of people even today. So you can imagine what it was like for people coming from far and near to participate in the Passover feast feast. People heard about the miracles of Jesus, and now that he's riding into town, the text says in verse number eight that they spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way, making way for the king to come in. Can I put another bookmark right here? I'm going to do it anyway, but I like to ask permission. Y'all remember that movie, Coming to America? 
I'm just trying to give us a visual understanding, if you will. So in the movie, the prince goes to Queens. And now the king is concerned about it because I guess he didn't text him or WhatsApp him or something, let him know what was going on. So now the king comes into town, goes to this big hotel, and as soon as he opens the door, there's these young ladies who got out before him. What did they do? They had baskets. And as he began to walk on the ground, they went around putting rose petals on the ground. Everywhere he walked, there were rose petals. They were putting them there. Why? Because the king was coming into the building. Well, can you imagine how they recognized that the king, if you will, was coming into town and to show reverence and respect for the king? What did they do? They cut down branches and they began to put them down in front of him to recognize him as their coming king. You see, I believe sometimes we just don't do what we can do to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Don't get quiet on me now. We find ourselves in a lot of different places and situations. And it's easy for us to just tell somebody who we know, who we believe in, who we're putting our trust in. The Bible says trust in the Lord with most of your heart, with all thine heart. And lean not to thine own understanding. We should let people know that we're trusting in Jesus on a daily basis. And we know that he's coming in. So what are they doing? They're putting down the, the branches to make way for the coming king. And people did that because they were honoring Jesus as the king. And they wanted to show him that they received him as this promised king of Israel. When the people started shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, they were actually fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy concerning the Messiah. The word Hosanna actually means save or help now. And they were shouting this not to the crowd, but they were shouting it to Jesus. Makes a difference. Because I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, if I'm hungry, I'm not going to go talk to a bricklayer. Y'all sit with me? I'm going to go talk to somebody who know how to cook. Amen. And here it is, Jesus is coming into town. They could have said that to anybody else, but here comes Jesus. And what do they say? Hosanna! Save or help now. Who? The son of David. Lord, help us here. The word Hosanna lets us know that they needed help and they recognized that Jesus was the one who could provide that help. In Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, the Bible says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And here they recognize that the help they needed could only come from Jesus. And I need us to understand something here. When he was coming into town, they were saying, Hosanna. Hosanna, help or save, Hosanna. When I get to the end, I want to share something with you. Lastly, we have our third and final point. Again, as I hurry to a close, number three, they identify. The Lord is identified. He's identified as the Lord, as the prophet, as the king. Something of note here in the text is that it says when Jesus entered into the city, that it, meaning the city, was moved. Let's look at that. Let's look at that so we can see that for ourselves. Verse 10, it says, And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. 
saying, who is this? Isn't it interesting? They're putting the branches down, and now they say, who is this? I'm just following through the text, y'all. You know, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like watching a movie, especially a movie with African Americans in it, and as soon as one starts running, what happens? Everybody starts running. And they're running, and they don't even know why they're running. They see them running. I mean, people running they're like, the person next to him, like, man, why are you running? He said, I don't know, everybody else was running. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. They said, tell the truth and shame the devil. I'm telling the truth. Isn't it interesting that people were cutting down branches and they were putting down the branches and I can imagine some of them were saying, why are we doing this? What's going on here? But since y'all doing it, I'll help you out. Lord, have mercy. It says when he came in, they were moved. This word moves come from a Greek word. That Greek word means to agitate. It says in any direction, it calls to tremble. It says to move, to shake, or to quake. Definition of the word move. So something agitated them, if you will, when Jesus came in. Sometimes, if you will, brothers and sisters, movement has a way of capturing our attention. And when that movement takes place, what happens? It causes us to begin to focus on some things. It appears the people here were moved when Jesus arrived, and now some of them begin to ask, who is this? It's right there in the text. Who is this? Dr. Warren Wiersbe adds here, and I quote, he says, Keep in mind that this Passover crowd was composed of at least three groups. The Jews who lived in Jerusalem, the crowd from Galilee, and the people who saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, John chapter 12, 17 and 18. Sharing the news of this miracle undoubtedly helped draw such a large crowd. The people wanted to see this miracle worker for themselves. Unquote. So to help us understand this concerning the Lord's arrival, if you will, the interpreter Bible says, again, I quote, but here it says that the crowd regarded Jesus as a prophet who had come to foretell the reign of God, but only as a prophet, unquote. But you see, the prophet spoken at this time and in this verse is really a direct reference to the Lord who is the Messiah and the one who was sent from God. You see, he had already shown himself to be the one with knowledge for not just today, but for things to come in the future as well. Again, an understanding of the hypostatic union of the Lord, which means he was 100% God and 100% man at the same time, it enabled him to share prophetically with the people. And we find evidence of this in John chapter 6 and verse number 14, which reads, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. The phrase that prophet makes reference to what was spoken of the Lord in John chapter 1 and verse number 45 that said, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Because you see, his coming into Jerusalem, the way he did, shows how he operated in one of his three offices, as priest, as prophet, and as king. 
they eventually came to the realization that Jesus was not just another dignitary coming into town, but was Jesus a prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. So in closing, my brothers and sisters, we see that the Lord made his way into Jerusalem and was acknowledged as a prophet. But we know him as king. We know him as king. Amen. And although we see that he made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we know that according to scripture, he's going to make an entry in the future like nobody else ever made. You see, in Jerusalem, he entered in, he entered in like other conquering kings, although he was riding on a colt and not on a stallion. But one day, he's going to enter in as king of kings. Let me say something real quickly as I finish up. He walked in the door, and they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Help or save now. Hosanna. But by the end of the week, they were saying something else. Here it is. They're acknowledging him as the prophet that the Bible spoke of. Moses, the prophet and the law spoke about. But by the end of the week, it was no longer Hosanna. It was now crucify him. Crucify him. Can I put a bookmark here for the next five minutes? You got to be careful hanging out with the crowd. Because the crowd may raise you up and tell you how great you are. Tell you you're the best thing since sliced bread and pockets on jeans. You're gooder than good and better than that. And as soon as you do something they don't like, they're ready to crucify you. Crucify you. What's interesting about Jesus is that Jesus did no wrong. He didn't do anything contrary to the word of God. He fulfilled all prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. But when people want what people want, people will do what people will do. They were given an opportunity to release Jesus. And they said, no, we want Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer. Jesus is the Messiah. They wanted what they wanted when they wanted it, and they got what they had coming to them. Because even when Jesus was hanging on Calvary's cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We see him riding in to Jerusalem on a colt. We recognize that the Bible teaches us he went to Calvary and died on an old rugged cross. Placed my Jesus in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, according to scripture, he got up with all power in his hands. I said that they saw him riding in. But I also said he's coming back again. And the Bible teaches us in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says, And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. I need some help right there. This same Jesus. If you don't mind, help me. I look at somebody and say, this same Jesus. Which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's going to come back the same way. The Apostle Paul tells us that the Lord's next triumphal entry into the world is going to take place according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verses 16 and 17. Let's keep in mind he went up in a cloud. Isn't that what it said in Acts? He went up in a cloud. Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them where? In the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I said before, if somebody tells you that they are Jesus, you should ask them, where's your cloud? Because my Bible teaches me that when he comes again, the next time he's not going to touch planet Earth, we're going to meet him in the clouds. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus is coming again. He went into Jerusalem. He's coming back to planet earth. The Lord came once to die for your sins and mine. The king is coming again to receive those who believe in him. So let me ask a question. Do you believe in King Jesus? Do you know King Jesus? Have you tried King Jesus for yourself? I'm waiting for the Lord's return. And can I be honest with you? I'm not overly concerned if I'm part of the dead in Christ or they which alive and remain. Because either way, I'm going to be with Jesus. Because the songwriter said, when I see Jesus, amen. When I see Jesus, amen. The one who died for me. The one who set me free. His name is Jesus. If you don't mind and if you're not ashamed, why don't you look at somebody and say, neighbor, his name is Jesus. Look at somebody else and say, neighbor, his name is Jesus. He came into Jerusalem. I can't speak for you, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad he came for me. Let me help you understand something. Sometimes when I'm preaching the word of the Lord, I get a little excited. We got, we got technology that's trying to keep up with us. So I'm standing here and I'm excited, right? Just want y'all to know. My watch is going off. Beep, beep, beep. So I look at it just now, and it says, it looked like you just had a fall. My watch. Now, if I had actually fallen, that would have been a good thing. But because I'm preaching, I don't need my watch going, BBD, BBD. That's technology. So I want y'all to know everything's okay. I'm still standing. I didn't have a fall. Amen. Amen. And I want y'all to know that Jesus is still alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 